Matthew, the 16th uh, chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. When you get there, say something. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but uh, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. God. I want to talk today simply for a few moments about the power of an inner circle. You may be seated. The power of an inner circle. In the writer's account, he begins with this snapshot, this picture of Jesus from childhood, right before he gets into his public ministry or the record of Jesus' life begins. It's as if it summarizes the time that he went through the temple as a child. We just have bits and pieces of his life from childhood. Then it fast forwards it to the period right before he enters into public ministry, beginning with the baptism of Jesus by John the Baptist. And there's an interesting phrase or passage that summarizes the years in between his childhood and his public ministry, and it goes like this. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Very interesting. I want you to capture this and freeze frame it. At the beginning of his ministry, before his public ministry began, listen to the words concerning his life that he, zero in on these words, he grew in favor with not only God, God released favor over his life, but he grew in favor and right relationship and good relationship with also people. People looked and said, man, he's the man. We like him. What a good kid. What a good man. He's all right with us. Man, Mary, you sure did raise a good son. Now I'm fast forward because this is the AP class, they told me, and you don't need me to labor, labor through this. Because it's the AP class, you already know that it's interesting, things took a turn. It went from Jesus being in favor with everybody, everybody, guys, to people eventually yelling, crucify him. And there was no battle, there was no war, all these people that he touched, healed, delivered, raised from the dead, sold into, ministered to, gave revelation to, showed that they were loved by God. It's interesting, when he goes to get crucified, no one comes to his defense, no one fights on his behalf, but it's as if his allies that he touched and blessed all disappeared, and some of, I'm sure, the same people that favored him at the beginning now yelled, crucify him. Isn't it interesting how life's narrative often changes? Life's narrative changes because there are seasons where we're celebrated by everybody. But interestingly, if you live long enough, uh, some of you are experiencing this in your teenage years, um, unprovoked haters will emerge. You doing all the right things, loving all the folks, there's somebody who's mad because you woke up. Life will take you on a journey and people's opinion, people's opinion about you can change on a dime. Don't have time to labor through this, but if I did have time to labor through this, I would tell you that sometimes that comes, we find, as Jesus' influence grows, as he becomes more popular, he's not in favor with everybody, but then these haters begin to emerge. Now, there's several reasons that it took place, but again, it moved from him being in favor with them to them yelling, crucify him. But the reality is some of them had a challenge with his popularity. Can I tell you, as God expands your territory and increases your influence, and that's what you've been praying for. Please understand, with new levels, there are new devils. 
you want God to expand your influence because you look at the shiny side of that. But if you flip that coin, what you'll see is with the expansion of your influence, with the expansion of your voice, with the expansion of the ministry or the purpose or the call God gives you, please understand elevation attracts greater haters than you've ever had before. Jesus' narrative changed. They were cool while they had him in the box, and he was blessing people in his little town, but the moment his territory began to expand, then greater criticism came. Not only will great criticism come when your territory expands, but greater criticism will come the more you begin to clarify your call. As long as you're aimlessly moving through life, just doing what you're doing, trying to figure it out, everybody's cool with you. But the moment you begin to zero in on your call, the thing for which God put you on this earth for, please understand everyone will not be happy about this. If you have a hater and you know it, clap your hands. Whenever you bring about, whenever you're different or bring about reform of any kind, listen to me, opposition comes. You try to move the water cooler at your job and you're going to have a fight on your hands. With every level, again, there was greater opposition. I remember when I first got to Antioch, and I, won, I was real, real revolutionary. And so I decided that because we were growing and I wanted to create more spaces in the sanctuary, what we did is we took, we had a, a, a contractor come out and just cut a window in the back of the church so that we could put about 30 chairs out in the lobby so that people could sit there and look into the service so that we got about 30 or 40 more people into the service without them having to peek through those little church windows. Isn't that torture? Who designed that? Are you with me? I mean, those church doors with the windows a sliver like this, like we only want one person to see at a time, you know? What's going on in there? I wonder what's happening. We decided we're going to do something bold. I'm going to cut a window in the back of the church so that people could see in. And I'm telling you, World War III broke out. <laughs> I had to get my faith level up <laughs> just to cut a window in the church. People were protesting. But that's our foyer. I said, okay, it's still that. <laughs> what is the problem? People shouldn't be able to see from there. <laughs> and I remember how I agonized for several weeks. Thank God for deliverance, but God will do is pressurize you at every level. He'll toughen you up at every level because he's called you for global ministry. And the reality is in preparation for that, you have to be pressurized for it. Because if you're not pressurized for where God's taken you, the pressure alone, the criticism alone, the, uh, the court of public opinion will crush you if you have not been pressurized for where God's taken you. I know you're asking for God to upgrade you, but your prayer should be, God, pressurize me. I didn't get two amens on that. It's all good. Now listen to me. Listen to how the commentary shifted. The beginning, Jesus grew in wisdom and favor, uh, in stature and favor with God and man. But as he continues his ministry, notice how the commentary shifts. I can't give you every incident of criticism against Jesus, but let me just give you a few. Matthew 3.22, don't turn there, it'll take you too long, Cletus. By the time I get there, you get there, I'll be done. Matthew 3.22, the Bible says that they looked at Jesus with all of his good works, and here's the conclusion they came to. They came to the conclusion that he was casting out demons by a demon. They looked at Jesus, all the good work he was doing, and said, you know what? What is it about him I don't like? I know it's something. We got it. He's demon-possessed. Jesus goes on with that discourse, and he says, how can a house divided against itself stand? If, 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 if demons are driving out demons, they're fighting against the same house. That's not how it works. He said, you know, often the church is the only place that tears one another down. He says demons work together real good. <laughs> So number one, they accuse him of being demon-possessed. Say demon-possessed. Luke 4, 29. Bible says, 
that as he went to his hometown and began to preach with power, the Bible says they were all, they all marveled at his message. He's good. That boy good. And then somebody leans over and says, good and terrible. That is the coming to America translation. Did you catch that? That is what happened. Listen, let me give you the, the, the real Bible. Since you guys don't believe me, I'm sorry. You're more spiritual than I am. So let me just help you out. The Bible says they marveled at his preaching. <laughs> Someone spoke up and said, wait a minute. I know he's preaching in power, but isn't that Joseph's boy? And the, then they began to resent him because they were familiar with him. Another place, he came to his hometown to preach, and he speaks boldly. The Bible said, number two, listen, the townspeople tried to throw him off of a cliff. Whew. I've been criticized, but I haven't preached that good where y'all try to throw me off of a cliff. John 7, 5, it said, as he was preparing for the high holy day, his brother said, what are you doing doing all these miracles here? You should be going to where it's at. You should be going to where everyone's gathering and doing these miracles. John 7, 5 said his own brothers did not believe in him. It's one thing to have people that don't believe in you out there. It's a whole other thing to have people that are in proximity to you that don't believe in your dreams. They don't believe in your visions. Has anyone ever had anyone on the inside at work against them? Oh, that's hard. Because you've gotten to a place where God's delivered you from the crowds, where I'm good. But the next tactic is not to have the crowds come against you. It's when people that are closest to you. And it's funny, when people don't believe in you, they don't have to say anything against you. You can tell they're not with it. You can tell as you're dreaming and as you have visions and as you're speaking about the possibilities, you can tell that they're out to lunch. Oh, yeah, that'll be good. Mm -hmm. What else is God going to do? <laughs> it's not what you say. You can sense it. I don't have time to work this, but if I did, I'll work this like a chicken bone until there was no meat on the bone. I would eat the meat off the bone, crack the bone open, and suck the marrow out. But I don't have time because I told you I was going to give you the CNN headline news version. But if I did have time, <laughs> I would tell you that this is the challenge even in some of our marriages. I what? I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything to her. What would I do? People can discern when you're dreaming, when you're trying to dream, but there's no belief. The Bible says he was trying to do his thing. And those closest to him, his own brothers, the Bible said, did not believe in him. And one of the hardest things I've ever had to do in ministry is spark the belief in people and lead an entire congregation with a vision that was from God to have people in my own family who didn't believe what God gave me. Does anybody know what it is? To have those who you should be finding support from, who don't lift you up, who don't offer the support you would expect. Well, Jesus was familiar with that. We can go on and on and on, but the religious leaders were against him. Some were disappointed in the general crowd because their expectation that he would, would be that he came with a kingdom as the Messiah and overthrew the Roman Empire. And he said, I'm not coming here to overthrow the Roman Empire. He says, I'm coming to overthrow the evil in people's hearts. Because if we can fix it in here, it'll get fixed out, out there. But can we admit that this is a hard world? It's difficult for every senior in this place, for every child in this place. This world is a, is a hostile place. And often as parents, what we want to do is cover our children from the hostility in this world while hoping there was somebody there to cover us from the hostility that we experience in this world. We're often not celebrated like we should be celebrated. We're not lifted up in those moments that we cry. There's some people in here, you've been depressed because you've had to cry in your pillow all night long, hoping someone would call, hoping someone would discern, hoping someone would see you, and you feel as if you've been unseen. This world can be hostile, hostile to anyone with convictions, hostile to anyone with beliefs, hostile even to the people like Jesus who want to reach people with love. This world can be cold. 
words of Rick James. <laughs> through Brother Dave Chappelle. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and tell him this world could be cold-blooded. <laughs> Yet we're called to dwell here. We're called to serve God here. We're called to love where we're hated. There's a call on your life that you have suppressed because of the hostility. Can I tell you what happens when you enter a hostile world? The force can be overwhelming if we're not careful. It can pressure us into, number one, abandoning the real us. If not careful, you will abandon the real you because of the opinions of everyone around you, the expectations of everyone around you, and you will look up and be conformed <laughs> to everyone's expectation, to everyone's opinions. Some of you feel like a chameleon, and you are fatigued because every circle you go in, you have to change your face, disposition, and the gift that you are to this world. But number two, it can force us to shrink, shrink back from our life's call. And I tell you that God has uniquely crafted you and he's made you a gift to the world to bring about the transformation that is needed. The challenge is everyone's becoming a cheap copy of someone else. And whenever there is, listen, whenever God's called you to pioneer something, you will brush against the grain. When God's called you to pioneer something, there is not already a pre-carved path. So you have to walk and clear the weeds at the same time, which is always more effort. But God says the effort's worth it because there are people that think just like you that are coming behind you that need the path car for them themselves you say it's been a hard road it's so difficult listen to me and you want to give up but please understand there's nothing like pioneering a new space God has called you to pioneer a new space but if you're not careful the criticism that comes when you're carving a new place will cause you to stop the work and to find the path of least resistance but can I just be honest with you? In this hostile world that we speak of where there's criticism on every hand, where everyone's opinion of us pressures us, the reality is sometimes, listen to me, the discouragement can be overwhelming. Can I just talk to some humans in here? I know you're safe, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, tongue-talking, demon-slaying, Water walking, water to wine, folks in here. I get it. You bad. But how many humans do I have? Just let me see your hands. Throw your hands in the air, please. Just so I'll make sure. Just wave them like you just don't care. Just so I know. Listen to me. For all the humans in this place, no matter how bold you are, if we were honest. We can stand on stage in boldness. We can stand in front of our friends with boldness. But there are times that, again, what you've stood boldly and declared, you doubt yourself. Well, people see you in strength, but then there's also vulnerability because the pressure is overwhelming. You've been the strong friend to everyone, so you can't even break down in front of the people because they're following you and looking to inspiration for you, from you. But the reality is there are some times you cry when nobody can see. I know it doesn't bother you, but can we just be real that criticism affects us? The going against the grain affects us. Not being accepted affects us. Not being celebrated affects us. People not believing in us that are walking with us affects us. Folks being over us affects us. Us losing the honor before the people that should give it to us affects uh, all of us. And it could be overwhelming. But what do you do in those moments where that pressure is overwhelming? Two things, that's all I can give you, and then we have to bounce. Number one, 
Jesus had both of these. And please understand, Jesus was not only model, modeling God incarnate, but Jesus was modeling the anointed human experience for us. There are things that Jesus didn't have to do, but he did to illustrate for us, so we'll have a pattern to follow him in. There are things that God does in dramatic fashion in Jesus' life so that we will have the pattern to follow him with. And number one, if we're going to make it in a hostile world with fierce criticism against us, we're all cool when we're in favor with everyone. And the challenge is the reason that many of us have not reached our potential is because we're unwilling to venture beyond people's celebration of us. Our friend Sam Chan says that we only grow to our pain threshold. When it hurts and we want to stop, we'll shrink back. But in order to get to where God's called us to do, we have to live often in the tension of progress and pain. Well, with every step, this is painful, and it will be healed eventually. But the reality is some of us never cross the line and go beyond the threshold of criticism, go beyond the threshold of pain to get to what God's promised. But Jesus himself had to get through the threshold of pain. It wasn't just for pain's sake. Some of us just love pain. I'm not looking for pain. I'm not looking for an argument. I'm not looking for a fight. I'm not looking for a disagreement. I'm not a glutton for punishment. And I, if you are, I'll pray for you after this service. But sometimes the purpose of God is on the other side of the criticism. The purpose of God is on the other side of the pain. The purpose of God is on the other side of the doubts of the crowd. And we've got to get there. The Bible says, not for the pain itself, but for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. He walked through the pain of the cross because he knew on the other side of the cross was your deliverance, your sins forgiven, your, your healing, you being reconciled to God. So he pushed beyond the pain to get to the the purpose. Sometimes God will put the purpose on the other side of the pain, but there's few that go get it because they're not willing to endure what it takes. And I know some of you felt that and was like, I'm a bad man. I'm a bad woman. I will. Shut up. Because here's what it takes. Number one, you cannot play your assignment and go against the criticism of the crowd until you first have what Jesus has. The first thing Jesus got before he ever walked into his purpose was he was baptized. The Bible says the heavens were open. The audible voice of the Father comes as the spirit descends upon Jesus like a dove. It said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to me. Before he did anything, he had the pleasure of his heavenly father. If you're going to make it against the criticism of the world, you have to know if nobody loves you, if no one's walking with you, if you don't do anything else. He didn't wait until he did good deeds and then say, I'm pleased. He said, I'm pleased before he did any good deeds to show me that I'm unconditionally loved no matter what I do, no matter where I find myself, no, what, no matter what struggle I'm currently engaged in. I have the pleasure of my God which is in heaven. And he says, I love you. There's nothing you you can do to make me love you any more. Nothing you can do to make me love you any less. There's no struggle that you're facing. There's no situation that you're in. Nothing can separate you from the love of whether you make your bed. And behold, I am there. You need to have the pleasure of the Father when you wake up. Can I tell you that many of us don't have the pleasure of God, so we have to find, fill that void with the approval of people. Whenever you have to fill that void with the approval of people, you're manipulated by their ends and their desires. But if you're going to make it, you have to know the pleasure of the Lord. I pray, this wasn't even my message, but I pray that you would know the pleasure of your heavenly Father. That you would know the presence or the, pre the, 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 the pleasure of God in your life. He loves you. He's pleased. And it's out of that pleasure and acceptance that we do everything we do. But there's one more thing. Back to our passage for the day. Some of the Bible teachers thought I forgot, but I didn't. We need the pleasure of the Father. And hear me. For somebody, this is going to preserve you in this place that you found yourself in where the weight of the world is on your shoulders. Not only do you need the pleasure of the Father, but you need an inner circle. Somebody 
his head. I have to get along with someone? You got to be kidding me. I have to let someone in? No, I love God because I can't see him if I could. <laughs> if he manifested to you, he probably, no, it's a person. I, have to, I can't, I can't, I cannot. A person did me wrong one time in my life. I will not do it again. Listen to me. But if you're going to make it with the weight of the world on your shoulders, you can't be in isolation. But you need an inner circle. Back to our passage. Now, we know that this is a foundational statement made by Jesus, that, that revelation that Peter gave, he built his church on. But can we go to the the model that he patterns for us. Can we go to the human side of this just for a second and show why we need it? Because none of us are the Savior. If we could see this through the lenses of what he's modeling for us in our human experience, here's what it would look like. Number one, if you're going to make it with fierce criticism against you, if you're going to make it in a hostile world, you need the pleasure of God before you ever go in there. That's why Jesus, he was baptized in Luke 3, but in Luke 4, Everything the devil threw at him, he was able to withstand as he walked through the wilderness, as he went back into the world because he had the pleasure of his father. But not only do you need the pleasure of father, you need some flesh and blood right here on earth. Jesus was walking, the Bible says, through Caesarea Philippi. I had the opportunity to go there when we were in the Holy Land, and most scholars would place this discourse, this conversation, in the scene where in Caesarea Philippi, in the rock, there are, you could still see them to this day, there are, there are platforms hewn out of stone. And scholars tell us those were the pedestals that all of their deities were platformed on there in Caesarea Philippi. And in the middle of all these other expressions, Jesus says, decides to have a lesson that sets us up for the revelation of who he really is. He, he says, fellas, what do the crowds say about me? What do they say? You ever wondered, you know, they say, who's they? <laughs> you know, pastor, they're saying, you know what they say about you. Who is they? It's your mama, isn't it? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. You know, that's always a telltale sign. I mean, if somebody that's already a rascal, you know, you just throw them under the bus. But if somebody in relationship to you, they say it's your uncle. Listen to me. He said, what do they say about me out there? Here's the reality. There will always be stuff about you out there. And if not careful, what you'll try to do is you'll try to fix everybody's opinion of you. And can I tell you, when you spend your entire life fixing everybody's opinion about you and doing all of the PR yourself, you are taken away as a distraction and never get to the work God's really called you to. Some of us are still arguing with spouses and arguing with our father. And we're 45 years old about how he treated us when we were 10. And there's a place for healing and there's a need for that. But listen to me, don't spend your entire life trying to prove to someone who does not see it the worth that you carry. Listen to me, don't spend your entire life trying to change everybody's opinion about you. Because for every moment you spend trying to change everyone's opinion, it's a moment you could have been. Uh, it's been spending in purpose. If you really have to do it, just hire a PR firm. Let them do it, and you can stay in purpose. <laughs> but listen to me. He said, what, what are they saying about me out there? Who do men say that I am, the son of man is? And they start saying all kind of stuff, and it shows us that everyone has this crazy stuff. None of it's right. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're a prophet. None of them are right. Jesus says, all right, fellas, second question. Who do you say that I am? Now, catch the revelation in this. There's all sorts of directions we can go with this, but for the sake of our walk with God, here's the revelation, and we're done with this. He said, when you're called to an assignment where there's critique, 
criticism, even if it's not bad criticism, but misunderstanding about who you are and what you're about. And when the, when the crowd's celebrating, you praise God. But when the crowd's not with you, how do you get through that? Number one, you get through it by knowing that the pleasure of God rests on you. But number two, you get through it with a good inner circle. Peter looks at him and says, I hear what they say, but let me tell you what I see. He said, you are. I know exactly who you are. Uh-huh, I got it. I got it. I didn't get it at first, but I know exactly who you are. You are the Christ, the son of a living God. Jesus said, shut your mouth. <laughs> he said, flesh and blood. That was the Wayne Cheney translation. That was the Shaft translation. I don't even talk like that. That was like old school. Um, he said, flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. He said, but my father, listen to me, listen to me, in heaven revealed that to you. And can I tell you, when the world is criticizing you, when you're called to do something bold, when you're called to pioneer new territory, you need two things. You need the pleasure of the father, but you also need an inner circle of people that no matter what the world is saying, no matter what they're saying out there, in here, this is who you are. We know who you are. We know what you're called to be. We know the assignment of God on your life. You're you're not weak. You're not. You're strong. You're not a follower. You're a leader. You're not the tail. You're the head. You're not a subject. You're the ruler. You are not broken down. You are favored by the Lord. And that is not a hype speech, but that is who God has created you to be. I love it. I need the pleasure of my father, but I need some folks on earth who will echo his voice in times of doubt, in times of fear, when I'm shrinking back. I need someone to ex echo his voice until I stand in boldness again and do what he's called me to do. I need an inner circle. Some of you have been trying to do this alone. You've been trying to do it by yourself. But God says, listen to me, you have to let somebody in. You have to let someone into your inner circle. You're going to have to bring someone who does not have just empirical observation or empirical data, but someone who can speak to you what God has spoken to them. I need some people, whether I'm in business, I need some people that have an ear to hear God. Whether I'm raising a family, I need some people that have an ear to hear God. Whether I'm believing for my business to go to the next level, I need the people that can hear God. If I'm in politics, I need a few folks around me that can hear God. When the storms of life come and I forget who I am, when the storms of life come and I'm no longer bold, Elijah was the one that called fire down from heaven, but we find him right after that in a cave weeping and crying, feeling as if he's all alone, all alone, running from his life, for his life, from Jezebel, feeling as if his ministry is over. His life is over. In those moments, we need someone to say, you are a woman of God. You are a man of God. You need somebody to say, you are a force listen to me and that will never consistently come from the crowd but if you want consistency you need people that have proximity people that are close to you you need an inner circle folks that are ride or die folks that are standing with you in good times and bad times those who celebrate your victories but also are there to uh, cry, let you cry on their shoulders when you experience defeat but then they dust you off and tell you to get back in the race you need an inner circle I don't need just anybody around me I need people who have spiritual sight of who I am and deal with me accordingly, who honor me accordingly, who lift me up accordingly, who push me back in the race. Now it makes sense. Let's stand together as we close. Don't talk to anybody, just stand together because I want to pray a prayer with you. Now it makes sense that Jesus... When Jesus, before Jesus ever called one of the disciples that would walk with him, the Bible says that he prayed to God, listen to me, all night long, all night long. Now, this is what gets me. If Jesus prayed, <laughs> prayed all night long, did the, 
determine who are the folks. I don't know if he was praying. He may have already known. He may have been praying that God just touches the hearts of the folks that are going to walk with him so that they, when he calls, would walk away from their business and say, we're with you. I don't know the nature of the prayer. The Bible doesn't give us the nature of the prayer, but all I know is he prayed all night long and he gets up the next morning with clarity concerning the people that are to be in his life, the circle, those that were to be a part of his inner circle. Listen to me. And I speak this prophetically. There are people in this place. The best years of your life, as I shared earlier, are not behind you. They are before you. The dreams that have been in your heart, God is going to bring them to pass. He's going to make them happen. The scale of your life is going to change. The magnitude of your life is going to change. The influence that you will carry is going to change. Listen to me. For some of you soon, for others in the year to come. But listen, I hear the Lord saying to us as a prophetic warning to, to build the relational architecture of your life to support not where you are but where you're going. If you believe God's called you to great things, you got to get ready. If you believe God for greater influence, you, you've got to get ready. Because with that comes greater criticism. You become a bigger target. And listen to me. If you don't have the pleasure of God resting on your life, and you don't know that pleasure. You don't receive his love. And number two, you don't have an inner circle in times where you should be bold you'll shrink back and retreat I'm going to pray a prayer in this place that God will give you divine insight, wisdom, revelation that he would open your eyes to some relationships that need to be shifted, moved around still love you but when I need, when I'm believing for something so big that I've got to keep my faith up, I can't have a Debbie Downer in my inner circle all the time. Not going to work. They tried that before. It's not going to work. I'll get up with you, boo-boo. But I need folks that can see beyond my circumstance and say, listen, it's going to be tough, but God is with you. I pray that God will open up your eyes, give you a spirit of discernment. The second thing is, I pray that God, as you lift up your voice, I'm going to pray now, but as you pray when you leave this place, that God would send those people. And listen to me. I prayed this a year and a half ago, not knowing the days ahead. And listen to me. God answered this prayer. He gave me more trusted friends. He gave me an inner circle, listen to me, in a few months, more than I've had in my entire life when I prayed to him. People that have cried with me, people that have told me I can make it, when I felt like I couldn't go on, people that helped to lift my arms up. Do not tell me what God will not do through prayer. And Jesus sends a pattern. He's before he ever selects one for his inner circle. He begins to pray. God says, you're going to make it? Because I'm one of the folks that's going to continue to tell you that it is your destiny. The dream in your heart can come to pass. It can happen. And this is not just another hype speech, but I've seen God do it. But then you need people that can echo the voice of God in your life in those seasons where you feel as if you can't make it. And so, Father, we thank you.